What I'm going to be talking about here is not like my ideas per se. This is sort of my perspective on, the, on a soup of ideas that, that has been uh, fermenting since January or so with uh, people like uh, Robert and Todd and Randall and Michael Andrag and, and others, but most, mostly people in this room, not entirely. Chris Owen as well, who's not here. Um, but anyway, um, it's sort of a concrete plan that's a baseline for um, how could we do a sort of crash course uh, uh, Apollo program sized kind of you know, 10 year, $100 billion effort to, to get uploading, uh, get to, to work. Um, so the, the, uh, the obstacle that this works around, so I, I, you know, I've been thinking about uploading for at least 10 years myself, 15 years more like, yeah. Uh, and, um, and, and sort of fundamental, there are two things that don't work in my opinion. Uh, it does not work to record, let alone do interventions on a living human brain, um, unless you have like neural dust and you can communicate with the neural dust with ultrasound. Uh, I think like ultrasound alone is not enough. <laughs> neural dust alone is not enough if you have to communicate by radio because you're gonna cook the brain with that much radio. Um, but you know, there is a way to do it. With, you know, neural dust ultrasound is maybe a way to do it if you had sort of super, uh, super, super uh, high resolution magnetic field imaging. That, that, that's about it physically if you're gonna do dynamics. And so that's not gonna happen um, in 10 years. Um, the other thing that doesn't work is it does not work to do electron microscopy with lipid staining and just think, oh, we'll figure out what happens in the synapses somehow because cell types are stereotyped. The, the Sebastian Sung hypothesis that you can infer from the connectome information about what receptors are at each synapse, I don't think that's gonna work. So these are two things that don't work. Um, the thing that I think might work um, involves expansion microscopy uh, because expansion microscopy can get you what are the receptors in the synapses with immunofluorescence. And you, you can get then high enough resolution that you can do light microscopy at a synapse level. Uh, but ironically, expansion microscopy makes it hard to see the neurons. <laughs> you, know, you can see the synapses, but the, the lipids get broken apart. Um, but now there seems to be uh, some ways of, uh, uh, of, of getting the lipids. There's, there's something called M-cling, which is sort of like an immunofluorescence indicator, but it sticks to lipids. Um, so then when you do the expansion, you can see where the lipids have been. Um, there may be other ways to do, to do it. Um, uh, there may, maybe we could do a traditional heavy metal stain of the lipids. You do the expansion, and then you uh, image the expanded sample with electron microscope. So you, it, there may be a way of doing it with um, a correlative light and electron microscopy. Uh, I don't know, these are, but these, are, these seem like possibilities where previously I didn't see any real possibilities at all. Um, and other, other uh, kinds of tools you might be able to incorporate into this kind of imaging system would be uh, you know, using light sheet fluorescence to get additional axial resolution and using a three scan style like diamond knife inside the microscope uh, to get additional axial range um, without, getting, uh, without getting too much loss um, in order to slice it thin enough for light imaging. Um, and uh, uh, one, one issue uh, with this is I think there's probably on, on the order of dozens of different proteins that you would need to tag um, in, in, you know, in, same, in the same sample in a human brain in order to, to actually see all of the relevant receptors for all of the relevant neurotransmitters. And so this would re this require kind of really pushing the limits and maybe push, be pushing beyond the frontier of barcoding um, or like repeated washing of something that's already been expanded. Um, this seems difficult. Um, so that's, that's one place where, uh, where there might be a roadblock. I think that's gonna be my, my challenge for the whiteboard. Um, so then uh, uh, you need, in order to scale this to, to a human brain size thing, uh, you need highly scalable, uh, largely automated, but, um, but, but easily maintainable kind of robotic um, sample slicing and then distribution. You know, sort of want like a binary tree of slicing to smaller and smaller size and then fanning out to a large number of actual cop copies of the actual imaging platform that are gonna be running in parallel with the uh, different parts of the brain. Um, and then for the, the translation bottleneck or they call it the problem map mapping statics to dynamics, um, organoids and, and human brain slices provide a, a, a sort of test case. I think it's important, I think it's critical even for validation that the specimens have human genomes because what we need to know is are we tagging all of the relevant proteins? And so if we're doing this in like mouse tissue, the set of relevant proteins is not going to be exactly the same as it is with human genome. But if we're doing human genome organoid, 
then it might well be, although there's still the possibility that organoid would end up developing in such a way that it fails to use a bunch of uh, proteins that would be critical in human brain. So we also want to validate with uh, slices from all of the different regions of human brain um, to make sure that um, we're not missing anything there. Um, but those are, those are two different ways. We, and we obviously should be able to get a lot more data from organoids than uh, human brain slices. Um, but the human brain slices would be sort of this extra validation to make sure we're not missing a whole, whole, whole class of, of receptors. <clears throat> and the thing that you do with these is you do a bunch of interventional experiments, especially, uh, again, on organoids, probably easier to transfect and get optogen optogenetic um, control in there so that you can do two photon uh, two photon optogenetics and do a bunch of you know, high throughput interventional experiments, do some causal analysis and get a sense of the dynamical system in a system identification style way from dynamics. The whole thing is thin enough that you can see, uh, see everything right? because you can you construct an organoid in kind of whatever shape you want with the extra cellular scaffolding. Uh, then once you've done a whole bunch of interventional experiments, then you do destructive imaging. You slice it the same way that you would have sliced human brain. Obviously, it's much quicker because it's much smaller. And then you basically build up a data set of the statics and the dynamics paired together um, and use uh, the fact that we have like uh, a pretty decent kind of hypothesis class, uh, Hodgkin-Huxley models or whatever the state of the art that uh, uh, Dmitry Cholsky is going to tell us about when he gets here. Um, and uh, use AI to, to learn how to, fill in the, how to fill in the parameters for that. Um, and then it's sort of just a matter of scale. Um, and the scale is like you build more microscopes, you build more of the automated sample prep. Like the scale out is kind of horizontal scale out rather than vertical scale out. And so it's something that probably is amenable to just pouring a lot of money into it uh, with this style of approach. Um, and then running the emulation is going to be relatively, relatively the easy and cheap part relative to the rest of it. Um, although I, we probably need uh, you know, to push the limit on, on aggregate bandwidth, um, it's not going to be an issue of pushing the limit on flop. I think you could run a human emulation in real time at a compartmental level on 1,000 GPUs. So this is like very much within reach um, computationally. But the aggregate bandwidth is a little bit, uh, a little bit out of reach. But uh, hopefully Michael, uh, Michael's product uh, will help us with that. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges here. Uh, I'm certainly not like confident that this is feasible, uh, but I'm not confident that it's not feasible, which for me is, is like cause for uh, celebration. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up there and, and go to questions. Awesome, thanks. Well, uh, the, the, the actual entire brain has uh, a, a like connectivity that is not super sparse. Um, so yes, to some extent it's sparse. It's not like completely airbrush rainy either, but like uh, there will need to be spike events that are transferred between processors that are far apart a lot. Um, and, and, and so, the, like the amount of just the amount of data that needs to be transferred between processors probably can't be brought down to the level of something like Ethernet, maybe InfiniBand, but pro it's probably beyond InfiniBand. In the back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Either way, we have enough time to um, So, on your point five, um, leverage AI to learn the mapping yeah. between statics and preparameters model. Um, can you just say a little bit more about like concretely how you see doing that? Yeah. Um, so the way I see uh, would see doing that is the the uh, parameters of the model are sort of um, the the model is like a parameterized dynamical system, and th so the parameters of the model are inputs which we would like to. Uh, optimize such that the resulting model has some statistical indistinguishability from the dynamics that we saw in the experiment. Um, and so this is a, a kind of optimization problem. Um, the naive, obvious thing to try is just doing some gradient-based method um, on those parameters as if they were parameters of an artificial neural network, even though the dynamics are completely different. Um, but then we could also go one level up and say, 
what if we trained a diffusion model to try to predict what the parameters would be given this as classifier free, given the data as classifier free guidance or something? Um, so there are a bunch of approaches, but uh, I don't talk too much in detail about it. <coughs> Is there a follow up question to that? Though? Is that yeah, I have a follow up question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the thing with uh, that kind of a problem, of course, is that when you have an old parameter system, there are a lot of ways that you can match or you can fit uh, a specific, you know, desired set of data. So um, unless you can carve it down so that you're only dealing with a very small part of the problem and you can do validation on that part, you can do your optimization on just a really small piece and then put all the pieces together, it's very hard to predict if you... Yeah, yeah, system. yeah. Sorry, I should, I should be clear that the parameters are, are not like, there's not like a parameter per neuron or multiple parameters per neuron of like, what are the time constants of this? Uh, it's, it's more like there's a, a handful of parameters per receptor protein, um, which are like, what is the relationship between the concentration of this protein in a synapse and the time constant that it induces and the amount per neurotransmitter of activation that it induces? Uh, and so what we're trying to learn in terms of these parameters of the mapping is probably only a few hundred numbers. And then the hope is that that applies uh, across all of the neurons. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. <laughs> yes. uh, so this is actually more about the this question, which is like the, one of the bottlenecks is that you're going to talk about this expansion. Yeah. Uh, yes. Like tooling thing with mclean. Why do we need lipids? Uh, you need lipids to know which uh, synapses are connected to the same neuron. If you just see all the synapses, then you kind of just have to guess, like, what, was this synapse connected to the same neuron as this other one? I mean, the, the, the lipids are what tell you where the, neuron, where the neurons are and where, where the compartments are. Maybe I'm missing something obvious. Maybe you just see that already. But. I think maybe she's implying that the protein, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you implying that the proteins would be enough to, like, all membrane proteins would be enough to localize the edges of the neurons? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what resolution we have, so like, I, uh, I don't know, but, like, like, like a question would be, like, is, is, are, are current techniques for, like, proteins, like, enough to kind of, like, distinguish between synapses? That's, like, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, if you imagine, like, the part of brain tissue where you've just got a bunch of axons and they're all twisted together, tracing that just by seeing the membrane proteins seems like it would be super hard. Hey, what's your challenge? I think you're yeah, I did. Yeah, so my challenge is how might we yeah. uh, how might we tag 32 membrane proteins and lipids in the same sample? 32 membrane. Repeat it once more. 32 membrane proteins and lipids in the same sample. In Okay, um, I'm working on my hand, honey. <laughs> so that will be okay. Um, thank you, Dominic. This is wonderful. Um, thanks for